Good morning. Please remain standing. It is an honor to be with you today, and it uh, has been great being a part of the Disciple Now weekend. If you would hold your Bible up and repeat with me, this is my Bible, God's holy word. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's authoritative. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is fire shut up in my bones. I must speak it. It is food for my soul. I am ready to receive it. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5. We say that the Bible is inspired, which is to say that God is its author. We say that it's inerrant, which is to say that God used human writers to write exactly what God wanted without error. We say that it's infallible to say that it will accomplish exactly what God wants it to accomplish. It will not fail. So in God's inerrant, inspired, infallible word, the Apostle Paul writes these words through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we confess that this is our, our last, our final, our only hope that Jesus rose from the dead. And we recognize that if Jesus rose from the dead, It changes everything. So we pray that today you would speak to us through your word. May you draw our hearts closer to you as we seek to live out what you've told us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So the title of my sermon is fitting in with the series you've been going through here at the church, Why um, I Believe the Bible. I want to share with you five reasons I believe the Bible. And one of the things I want to begin with is something I tell my students that I teach at Cedarville on a regular basis, that sometimes as Christians we feel like we're somehow in a different category than most people, that other people have kind of good reasons to believe what they believe, but as Christians we just accept everything by faith. So an atheist might, our atheist neighbor or our atheist coworker, they might have really good facts, but we're the ones who operate by faith. Now, Christianity is not without its facts and evidences, but what I would want to say is every worldview, every way of viewing the world and making sense of the world, operates off of a basis of faith. Every worldview accepts its own source of authority by faith, and let me try and explain that a little bit more. If you were to talk to someone who's a rationalist, a rationalist is someone who sees human reason as the chief way of knowing truth. If you were to ask them, why are you a rationalist? They're going to go into their Bible and give you chapter and verse. They're going to give you a rational explanation for why they're a rationalist. That's their Bible that they accept by faith. If you were to ask an atheist, why are you an atheist? They would likely go into their Bible, a view that says there's just a physical world, and we understand it through science, and they'll give you chapter and verse. They'll begin giving you scientific reasons for why they're an atheist. For the Christian we're not any different. We believe that we have an ultimate source of authority, and it's the Bible. There's good reasons to believe the Bible, but like other worldviews, there is an element of faith. There's an illustration that I think makes this clear. There's a guy named James Sire, who is a Christian philosopher. He went to be with the Lord um, last year, actually. And he has a book called Naming the Elephant. And it begins with the story of a boy who goes to his dad And his world has been absolutely rocked. At school, his teacher told him that the earth isn't sitting on top of anything. And in his experience, everything sits on top of something. 
right? I mean, because of gravity, that's our reference point. And he says, Dad, that is, my teacher can't be right. The earth has to be sitting on something because everything sits on something. And his dad thought he'd have a little fun with him, and he said, I'm going to let you in on a secret, son. Your teacher's wrong. The earth is sitting, which you shouldn't do, all right? Um, the earth is sitting on top of something, and his son, his eyes got real big, and he said, Dad, what is it sitting on top of? He said, it's on the back of a turtle. That's how it goes around the sun, and, uh, which apparently is not sitting on anything, but anyways. So the boy's all excited. The earth is on the back of a turtle, and he runs off, and he comes back in a little bit later, and he says, but Dad, what is the turtle on? And the dad said, well, it's on the back of a camel. And now at this point, it's like going to the zoo. This kid is just ecstatic. This is great. His teacher's wrong. He's right. The, the earth is on the back of a turtle that's on the back of a camel. He runs away, and then he comes back even quicker this time, and he says, Dad, what's the camel on? Now, if you've had kids, you know this is how it goes, right? Um, and he says, well, son, it's on the back of an elephant. So he runs away, comes, almost immediately comes back, and he says, but Dad, what is the... What is the elephant standing on? And uh, the father says, it's, son, it is just elephant all the way down. Just all the way. It's all elephant. Now, you recognize he didn't answer the question, did he? Um, but that's how every way of viewing the world functions. There's some point where we would say, this is just where it, it hits pay dirt, if you will. There's a certain operating point that we start with that we accept by faith, whether you're an atheist whether you're um, a Christian, whatever your worldview is, you have an elephant. You have something that you would say, this is the final explanation that I accept by faith. I want to give you a quick quote. I'm going to try not to use too many today, but there was an article published years, a few years ago called Irrational Atheism. And I love it when you can find a skeptic who will admit that their worldview is based on faith. The guy who wrote this article is named Crispin Sartwell. And in the first slide, you're going to see he describes an atheistic view of the world. He says that atheism pictures the universe as a natural system, a system not guided by intelligent design, that's not traversed by spirits, a universe that can be explained by science. This makes sense, right? Because it consists of material objects operating according to physical laws. But then he concludes, ironically, this is similar to the totalizing worldview of religion. Neither can be shown to be true or false by science or indeed by any rational technique. Then he gets even more honest. Look at the next slide. He says, whether theistic, which means belief in God, or atheistic, which is a rejection of God, they're all matters of faith. Stance is taken up by tiny creatures in an infinitely rich environment. And then he says, I have taken a leap of atheist faith. It's hard to find an atheist to be that honest about it. And then he says, the idea that the atheist comes to her view of the world through rationality and argumentation, while the believer just relies on arbitrary emotional commitments, is false. And what he's recognizing is that he has an elephant. He has something he accepts by faith that he can't prove, and he recognizes that he's taken a leap of atheist faith. Well, I believe the Christian way of viewing the world actually requires less faith because it explains more than atheism does. I want to share with you five reasons I believe the Bible. The first reason may sound underwhelming to you. In fact, if you use the first reason with your skeptic relative or coworker, um, they're probably going to kind of roll their eyes, but I just want to be honest. I believe the Bible because I became a Christian. And so I have more arguments than that, but that's the first reason I believe the Bible is because God opened my eyes to see its truth. And I really believe that apart from that happening, apart from the Spirit of God working in our lives, we, we are blinded, as the Apostle Paul says. So this is my elephant. Now we go on to say every worldview is basically a story that's trying to make sense of the world we live in. The atheist worldview argues that the world came into being by chance, it's governed by nothing, and it's heading nowhere. The Christian story is simply better and to borrow a pet expression from Henry Kissinger, it has the added benefit of being true. So I believe the Bible. 
I'm not playing fair today, am I? I believe the Bible because I became a Christian. There's actually a biblical warrant for this. Paul tells Timothy, the young Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, it'll be on the screen. He says, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's telling Timothy, Timothy, you should believe the Bible because your mama told you to and your grandmama told you to. But then he goes on to say, all scriptures breathed out by God. What did they teach you about these sacred writings? That they're inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction. So the first reason I believe the Bible is because I became a Christian. The Bible showed me how I could know Jesus. The second reason I believe the Bible is because it's powerful. It's a living book. We don't just read it. It reads us. It speaks of its own truthfulness as we read its pages. There's a a story I love that illustrates this. There's a a lady we had speak on our campus at Cedarville last year. Her name's Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria was a lesbian. She was a well-established professor. She was a tenured literature professor at Syracuse University. She was at the top of her game, and she started to read the Bible as a research project. One night, she says that she had, her and her her lesbian partner were hosting a um, group of people from the LGBT community in her home and for a meal, and she walked back into her kitchen, and a friend of hers who was a man who identified as a woman who was a former pastor followed her back. And she said he put his large hand, she describes, on her hand. And he said, Rosaria, I'm worried about you. And Rosaria responded to him, this man who identifies as a woman. She responded and said, I've been reading the Bible. Her friend responded saying, I know. And I'm worried about you. And she said, well, I'm worried. What if it's true? And he responded, it's all true. She, as she poured over the Bible for a research project, she had a Presbyterian pastor and his wife who became friends with her and started inviting her to their home for meals. And in time, she became convinced of the truthfulness of the Bible. She asked her, lesbian partner to move out. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. And today she is a pastor's wife. Now, if you want to read her story, she has a little book called The Secret Confessions of an Unlikely Convert. And because she was a tenured literature professor, it is beautifully written. But what's even more beautiful than the, the prose that she's writing in is the story. The Bible's powerful. The author of Hebrews says it this way, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thought and intentions of the heart. It reads us. If you don't believe me, don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. If you're here today and you're skeptical of this, we mean no disrespect to you at all. None of us became Christians because we were so clever or because we were so good. But there's something about reading this book that it reads us and we find in it hope and life. And the reason, one of the many reasons we meet on a Sunday like this and why we want people from the community to come is because we want you to take and live, (laughs) to read this book for yourself. Paul says this in Romans 10. How will they call on him who they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So Paul concludes, faith is comes by 
hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I believe the Bible because I became a Christian and because it's powerful. The third reason I believe the Bible is it just makes sense of the world I live in. There's a professor who teaches philosophy at Duke University, and he's an atheist. His name's Alex Rosenberg, and he wrote a book called The Atheist Guide to Reality. I pick on him all the time. Uh, I'm sure he's a great guy, but his book's so helpful. He just says things I think sometimes other skeptics might be unwilling to say. And in the book, he begins by saying, as atheists, we need to accept that the only way we know things is through science. So he had the, the central statement of his book is um, physics, the study of the physical world through science, physics fixes the facts. That's how we know what's true. Now, the question we should ask to that is, did he discover that truth through physical science? Did he see it through a telescope or did he find it under a microscope? Does that make sense? In other words, the statement doesn't even live up to its own standard. Another atheist a long time ago, Bertrand Russell, who is a prolific atheist author, he said it this way, what science cannot teach us, we cannot know. Did science teach you that? What telescope did you see? What, you know, where is it written in the stars? And so Alex Rosenberg begins with science, and he says, if we only accept those things that science can explain to us, we have to give up a lot, but that's just the price of living life without illusions. The things he says we have to give up, we have to give up the idea that we're persons. He says you're not a person. You're millions of chemical reactions in your brain. There's no you who's kind of supervising all those experiences. You're not a person, which is interesting because he seems to, as a person, be writing a book to other people <laughs> who are persons. And then he says, and you can't make decisions. There's no non-physical part of you that's called the will. Science can't explain the will, so you can't make real decisions. Your brain decides for you and then tricks you into thinking that you decided for yourself, he says, which is interesting because he seems to have written the book to get people to change their mind about atheism. <laughs> How can I change my mind as an act of the will if I don't have a will? And he goes on to say more troubling is that there's no such thing as moral distinctions. Because science can't show us that one thing's right and another is wrong. He, see, he says, we need to recognize that moral distinctions are just illusions. Nobody lives like that. I'll tell you why. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 2, God has written his moral law on our hearts. We know that there's a moral law to the universe, and it leads us to know that there's a moral law giver. Now, unlike Alex Rosenberg, I believe, and I put this on a slide because it's a bit of a mouthful, that the Christian view of reality makes sense of the world we live in. Instead of having to reject what it means to be human and the ways that we know to live, Christianity actually makes sense of it. The Christian view of reality makes sense of where the world came from. Did you know that throughout most of human history, most great thinkers have believed the universe was eternal and didn't have a beginning, including Albert Einstein? until it was pointed out to him by Robert Friedemann, who was a junior scientist, that his theory of general rel relativity actually pointed to the universe having a beginning. So Robert Friedemann's biography is The Man Who Made the Universe Expand. It's published by the University of Cambridge Press. And the reason it's titled that, he opened Einstein's eyes to the fact that his theory pointed to the world having a beginning. You want to know who was right about that since the beginning? The Bible. Yeah, <laughs> God. So the Christian view of reality makes sense of where the world came from. It makes sense of the way the world is with beauty and with horror. The fact that we understand that the world is cursed because of sin makes sense of the fact that the world's beautiful and ugly at the same time. It makes sense of humanity's longing for something greater. Our moral sense of right and wrong and our sad realization that we're out of step with this moral law. C.S. Lewis said in his book, Mere Christianity, he's arguing that we all know there's right and wrong, and he says that points to a moral law giver since there are moral laws. And he concludes, he says, but if there is a moral law giver behind the moral law, he must hate most of what we do. And he's right. The Christian way of seeing things makes sense of our guilt and our shame, our longing 
for forgiveness. The skeptic may deny the existence of God. What they can't deny is when they turn the light off at night, there's a guilt and a shame that is haunting. It also makes sense of our optimism. This sense that somehow things are going to turn out better. Why would you believe that if atheism's true? If atheism's true, the universe came into being by chance, is governed by nothing, and is headed nowhere. Why are we so stubbornly optimistic? It's because Jesus has promised a new creation. C.S. Lewis said it this way. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Now, there are a couple ways you can know the sun has come up. One of them is like I did this morning. It's easier now that we've had the time change. I got up early enough to sit in the hotel lobby and have some coffee and read my Bible and look over my notes, and the sun hadn't come up yet, so I was able to watch the sun rise. Another way to know the sun has come up, I have my twins with me on this trip. They're in the hotel room. When I left them, the hotel room was dark, but at some point they woke up because the hotel room was illuminated by the sunlight, right? So they weren't looking at the sun. They were seeing everything else by the light of the sun, and Christianity is like that. We could look at it, the thing itself, the resurrection of Jesus. Or by it, we can make sense of everything else. So I believe the Bible because I became a Christian. It's powerful. It makes sense of things. And then number four, there's just a lot of evidence for the Bible. I don't have much time to to get to everything I'd like to say, so I just want to offer some summary points. But Christians have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the evidence for the historical trustworthiness of the Bible. The Bible makes the evidence for every other ancient document look laughable. And you probably can't see this next slide. It has a graph on it. It says the reliability of the New Testament. But let me just summarize a couple things for you. The way that scholars try to understand how trustworthy an ancient document is, they want to understand how many early copies do they have And how close can they get to the original? Often with an ancient document, they were written on materials that wouldn't last really long. And um, so people would make copies of them through the centuries. And what we end up having access to are not the original ones that were written, but copies of copies. And so, for example, the greatest um, attested to or evidenced document from um, history outside the Bible is the work of a blind poet named Homer. Homer's Iliad... We have 643 ancient copies of Homer's epic poem. That's a lot. In comparison to other documents outside the Bible, that's the best. That's as good. That's like the Cadillac of evidence for historical documents. The earliest copy that we have is 500 years after Homer originally wrote his epic poem. So the original was lost or copies made. The earliest one we have is about 500 years old. Compare that to the philosopher Plato. Plato, who recorded the works of Socrates, the philosopher, um, his writings, we only have seven ancient copies of Plato's works. And the earliest copy we have from Plato is 1,200 years after the original. Now compare that to the New Testament. The New Testament has over 24,000 ancient copies in multiple languages. If you were to look at just the Greek copies, the ancient Greek copies, there are nearly 6,000 Greek copies of the New Testament. Fragments found here or there. Our earliest ones date to within 40 to 70 years of the original writings. I mean, the, the amount of evidence that we have for the historical reliability of the Bible makes the evidence for Homer's Iliad look pathetic. And yet no one questions whether or not Plato actually recorded the words of Socrates. We have philosophy degrees around the world, and they're teaching from these seven ancient copies from Plato that are 1,200 years after they were originally written. And nowhere in liberal arts education do we question the authenticity of classic works like Homer's Iliad, and yet the New Testament is often scoffed for being a book that's without evidence. That's not the case. I believe the Bible... Because there's loads of evidence. Let me give you one example from a guy named Sir William Ramsey. Sir William Ramsey, I've got a picture of him on the screen. 
Um, Sir William Ramsey was the first professor of classical art and archaeology at the University of Oxford. And he felt like the New Testament writers didn't really care about history. And so actually we're going to skip Joy. Thank you. Joy, it's Joy's birthday, by the way. Everyone say happy birthday, Joy. And uh, <laughs> if you'll skip ahead to the, the, the picture of the old guy, not the young, hip-looking guy. There we go. Thank you. So this is Sir William Ramsey, and uh, first professor of classical art and archaeology at the University of Oxford. He started out his research by believing that the Bible had no value for archaeology at all. And as a skeptic, you wouldn't expect him to think it would. He just assumed the Bible's not going to be helpful. And so he said this on the first slide. Luke, he's referring to Luke. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. He wrote both of them. He said Luke's object was not to present a trustworthy picture of the facts in the period of about AD 50, but to produce a certain effect. He was writing in a way that he just wanted people to have a certain emotional response of his own time by setting forth a carefully colored account of events and persons of that older period he wrote for his contemporaries, not for truth. I mean, he's just trying to make people feel good, trying to impress people maybe, but he's not writing for truth. However, <clears throat> Sir William Ramsey had a change of mind and more importantly, a change of heart. The evidence led him to conclude that the Bible is historically reliable. The evidence also led him to conclude that if he could trust the Bible for his archaeological research, he could trust it for his salvation. He concluded later in life, further study of Acts showed that the book could bear the most minute scrutiny of an authority for facts of the GM world, and that it was written with sound judgment, skill, art, and perception of the truth as to be a model of historical statement. Now I don't have time to mention the mountain of archaeological research that supports the Bible as well. I'll give you one quote. This is from a Nobel Prize winning archaeologist, Nelson Gluack. From several years ago, he's featured on the cover of Time magazine. And he said, again, an award winning archaeologist, he said, as a matter of fact, however it may be stated categorically, that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. I'm a I believe the Bible because I became a Christian. It's powerful. It makes sense of things. There's a ton of evidence. If you don't believe me, research it for yourself. I invite you to research it. Read the Bible and research whether or not it's historically reliable. The final reason I believe the Bible is simple. I believe the Bible because Jesus rose from the dead. And as a general rule of thumb, you should take the words of people who rise from the dead very seriously. <laughs> and Jesus took the Old Testament seriously, and the New Testament are his words and his instructions for the church that is in his name, and it f includes the promises of his return. So Jesus took the Old Testament seriously. Because he rose from the dead, I take the Old Testament seriously too. And I also take the New Testament seriously because it's the words of Christ, and it's the story of his church. I'll show another skeptic. I like to sometimes put words in the mouth of people who disagree with us so you don't feel like I'm giving just a soft argument. But look, at this is Bart Ehrman, who's an atheist, and he's a critic of the Bible. He often will debate Christians about whether or not the Bible is historically reliable, but he finally got tired of skeptics who were arguing that Jesus never existed. So he wrote this book called, Did Jesus Exist? And the subtitle to the book is, The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth. And he concludes, look at this summary quote. Despite the enormous range of opinion, there are several points on which all scholars of antiquity agree. Jesus was a Jewish man. Again, this is an atheist, but he's saying, the evidence shows us Jesus really existed. He was a Jewish man. He was known to be a preacher and a teacher. He was crucified in Jerusalem during the reign of the Roman Emperor Tiberius when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. He says, you can't deny the history that Jesus really existed. Now, there's a, an apologist. An apo apologetics is, means just giving an answer for what Christians believe. 
And so when someone's called an apologist, that's someone who does that. They try to give an answer. And there's a guy named Gary Habermas who's actually friends with your pastor. And he did his PhD at the University of Michigan on the resurrection. And his supervisor wasn't a Christian. So his supervisor said, I'm only going to allow you to include in your research things for which there's a great deal of evidence outside of the Bible. And things that universally scholars accept, whether they're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or skeptic. So these are just six. He has a longer list of 15. Let me give you six things really quickly that there's a great deal of evidence for outside of the Bible and that there's wide support among various scholars. Here they are. They're pretty simple. The first thing, that Jesus died by crucifixion. The second, that Jesus, that the disciples believed Jesus appeared to them. So these secular scholars will say, we don't believe Jesus actually rose from the dead, but it seems like the disciples did. We can't deny that. Third, that the disciples were actually transformed as a result of what they thought they saw. They went from being timid fishermen to being bold martyrs. Fourth, that the resurrection was taught early after the crucifixion. It wasn't a later development. Now, if we have more time, we could look at how myth and legend develops. It takes scores and scores and even centuries of years for a myth and a legend to develop. They don't develop early. So scholars recognize from various backgrounds that the resurrection was taught early. How early? Well, I'm going to conclude today by showing that there was a creed that was developed by early Christians within months of the resurrection. And that creed was in a formal way passed down to others, And it was passed down to the Apostle Paul. And we read the passage earlier. He said, I delivered to you what I received. And that creed that he gave us that we read about in 1 Corinthians 15 was on the lips of the disciples after the first Easter. The teaching of the resurrection is early. Number five, James became a follower of Jesus after seeing the risen Jesus And then finally, that Paul became a believer after being a persecutor of the church. These are things for which there's a great amount of evidence, and it's universally accepted. Now I want to go back to what we began with, 1 Corinthians 15. We see here that Paul uses the expressions delivered and received. Now this is a way that a teacher could actually signal that they're going to give you a creed. These are rabbinical Jewish teachers, this is a way they would format um, passing on a creed. I've received it, I'm delivering it to you. And so Paul is telling them, I'm giving you a creed. There's a lot that I would love to point to, but I'll just say this. Um, Historians, atheist historians recognize that this creed had to be developed within two to three years at the most after the resurrection. Even atheist scholars, and I have some quotes I could put on the screen but I don't want to bore you with them, but they're there. I might send this to Pastor Dave, and we could post the PowerPoint somewhere if you want to have access to it. But people like Robert Funk, who is the founder of the Jesus Seminar, which sounds really good, but it wasn't. It was a group of skeptics who doubted um, the the historical claims of Jesus. Robert Funk says this creed had to be developed within two to three years. Gerd Ludemann, who's an atheist, says this creed could be no more than three years old. I love this one quote from a guy named Peter May, who is a believer, to be clear. He's the head of the General Synod of the Church of England, or was. He said, the date is so firmly established for this creed that it has become one of the linchpins for working out the dates of the rest of the New Testament chronology. So Gary Habermas gave us a list of basic facts, and he asked the question, how do we make sense of these facts? The way a crime scene detective would do, you look at the facts, and you come up with a theory that tries to account for all the facts. I would contend today that the resurrection is a theory that makes sense of the facts. And this creed that was developed early on was passed on to the Apostle Paul, And he passed it on to us, and we're passing it on to our children and our grandchildren still. A couple examples of people who've tried to disprove Christianity. I mentioned cold case um, detective work. J. Warner Wallace was a cold case detective. He was also an atheist. 
And he set out, he thought if the resurrection, it's a historical claim, and he said it's basically a cold case, a crime. And he set out to consider the claim for the resurrection using his cold case detective methodology. And he came to be convinced that the resurrection was true. Look at what he says. If we approach the issue of the resurrection in an unbiased manner, I don't think that that's entirely possible, but he says if we did, we can judge the possible explanations and eliminate those that are unreasonable, theories that are unreasonable. The conclusion that Jesus was resurrected, as reported in the Gospels, can be sensibly inferred from the available evidence. The resurrection is reasonable in light of the evidence. Another person who set out to disprove the resurrection is Lee Strobel. He was an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And his wife became a Christian, so he kind of had to deal with it, right? So she became a Christian, and he thought, I've got to make sense of these things. So he decided to take his investigative methodology and apply it to the claims of Jesus. He talks about it in his book, The Case for Christ. And he concludes, I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God who proved his divinity by rising from the dead. That meant following him was the most rational and logical step I could possibly take. Now, if Jesus has risen from the dead, it proves that every other religious claim is false. If Jesus rose from the dead, it delivers a death blow to the secular worldview. Atheism is categorically false if Jesus has risen from the dead. If Jesus has risen from the dead, it demonstrates that Islam is a false religion based on the teachings of a false prophet about a false god. If Jesus rose from the dead, it proves that Hinduism with its many gods is confused because there is one God and there is only one way to God through his son, Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, the Christian need not say Christ has risen and nothing else matters, but rather we should say Christ has risen, now everything matters. It changes everything. I love how C.S. Lewis describes his spiritual journey. This will be the last quote I'll put on the screen. C.S. Lewis in his book, Surprised by Joy, which is his autobiography, is describing how he went from being an atheist to believing in God and becoming a Christian. And he said, you know, I I finally came to the place where I couldn't get away from it. Everywhere I went, people were pointing me back to God, even people that didn't mean to. So here's how he describes the conversation he had with an atheist colleague. Early in 1926, he calls him the hardest boiled of all the atheists I ever knew. Sat in my room on the other side of the fire and remarked that the evidence for the historicity of the Gospels was really surprisingly good. Rum thing, he went on. All that stuff of Frazier's about the dying God, rum thing. It almost looks as if it really happened once. And C.S. Lewis said that was the night he knew he couldn't get away from it. And he describes his spiritual biography, his journey. He says, some people talk about searching for God. He said, I was no more searching for God than a mouse searches for a cat. He said, God was the hunter and I was the prey. And the hound of heaven was on his heels. I'll close with this story about, um, I used to lead a ministry at the University of Louisville. And uh, we had, our church had different campuses, like you guys have different auditoriums. We just had an auditorium that was on the other side of town, and it met on the campus of the University of Louisville. And I was the lead pastor for that campus. We met in a building called the Red Barn, which was neither red nor a barn. Uh, (laughs) You know how those things happen. And we shared the building with one student organization, the LGBTQ office. And if you don't know what those terms mean, it means lesbian, gay, bigender, transsexual, and queer. And we discovered that it's possible to have really good friendships with people who really disagree with you. I mean, the New Testament says they will know us by our political stances. They'll know us by the signs we put in our front yards. No, they'll know us by our our love. And so we also inadvertently started an atheist organization on campus. And uh, we had a student who came to our meetings every week 
my wife's here, and I, she's laughing as I say that because she knows the story. But we had a student who I became good friends with, and I'm still good friends today, um, who's a committed atheist and is now a transgender, and we're still friends. It's, it's possible. You could, you could do that. Um, you don't have to compromise who you are, and, you know, hopefully in time, God will work on their heart. But anyways, we met in the Red Barn, and there was one student who showed up who was originally from Vietnam, and I wanted, I could tell he seemed close to responding to the gospel. And so I, I'll, I'll call him, um, I'll call him Sam for the sake of this example. I won't, I won't use his real name. So Sam shows up to several meetings, and I think this guy's ready to believe in Jesus. Real quiet kid. And so we set up a, a time for us to meet at the coffee shop on campus, and we sat down, and he brought a friend with him. And we'll call his friend Corey. Now, Sam was really quiet. Corey was not. So I didn't show up to talk to Corey. I came to talk to Sam. This is the first time I met Corey. But we're trying to talk, and I can't pull more than one-word answers out of Sam. But Corey is loquacious, which is a big word that means chatty. And so Corey is just like blah, 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 asking all these questions. So I finally like literally took my chair and turned towards Corey <laughs> I'm like, Sam, you're just going to have to listen in because this is where it's at right now. And so Corey's asking questions about, you know, why do you believe in God? And we're working through all the kind of arguments that you would expect to work through. And uh, at one point, he goes, you know, some of, your, some of your answers seem to make sense for why it makes more sense that there's a God than everything happens by random chance. And so some of this, he said, is helpful. He said, but you know, if there is a God, you have all these different religious claims, all these different religions. If there really is a God, I mean, come on, why wouldn't he just come down and say, this is the one true way? <laughs> yeah. And I just stopped, like, my mouth, my, my jaw hit the floor, I'm like, this is going to be, and I was kind of like, was it Babe Ruth or Mickey Mantle? He used to point when he was going to hit a home run, yeah, Babe Ruth. I was like, yeah, I'm waiting because I don't want to answer too quick and make him think I didn't pay attention to his question. But I felt like internally, I'm like, I'm going to hit it right out there. <laughs> like, here we go. I'm going to knock it out. And so I'm waiting, and then Sam speaks up. And he says, duh, Jesus. <laughs> and I guess those two words summarize better than anything else I could say. I believe the Bible because, duh, Jesus if he rose from the dead, we should take this book seriously. And he rose from the dead. We're, I'm going to pray, and Pastor Dave's going to come and lead us in an invitation. Um, if you have questions about the Bible, the last thing we want you to do is to agree just for the sake of agreeing. We want you to explore these things for yourself. But if you want to talk to somebody, we'd love to talk to you and start this conversation. If you're here today and you know someone maybe a son or a daughter, someone you love and care about who's wandering and wrestling with the faith and you want to pray for them or have someone pray, please let us know. I'm going to pray for us now and then Pastor Dave will, will lead us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way that you love us and the way that you pursue us. And today as we look at the Bible, we thank you that you have not left us to figure things out on our own, but you've revealed yourself in history. So thank you for your word. I pray that you would allow this word to change our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our Bible. We can trust it, live it, and share it. As Dan shared, We've all had loved ones that have wandered from God, some of them because of issues of doubt and hurt and bitterness and questions. Just a moment, we're going to extend an invitation. I really would like to invite you to come. Get on your knees if you can, stand if you can't, and just cry out to God. He is a real God. He does pursue people. He knows their name. Just come and cry out to God to increase his work in their life and draw them 
through situations, circumstances, conversations, information you might share with them, draw them to himself. If some of you are doubting, maybe today answered your questions. You just need to recommit. Yes, God, I recommit myself to you and to your book. Maybe you'd like to express your interest in joining a church that holds high the Bible and believes it is the Word of God. Maybe you need to be born again today into the family of God. As we stand, you come. Come and pray for your loved ones. Don't leave this opportunity to ask God to work in their lives. Let's stand together. The Bible this week. Can I see your hands? How many of you read more this week than you did the week before? Can I see your hands? Good job. If you don't have one, you can pick one up in the lobby. Dan, we're going to let you head back there to your book table uh, in the lobby. And uh, you can take your family along with you if you like. Let's thank Dan for sharing with us today. <clears throat> and sharing with our students this weekend. If your next step is membership, stop by the Next Step kiosk. We had over 20 folks complete our membership seminar last week. Two were born again while we were uh, doing that. Uh, if you need to um, communicate your desire to be baptized, do that today at the Next Step kiosk. You need to dedicate your child to the Lord. Do, uh, you can stop at the Next Step kiosk as well. Father, we just ask in the name of the Lord Jesus that you help us, not just to believe, have a Bible, not just like the Bible, but believe it, live it, read it, study it, share it, God, and make a difference through the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.